welcome everyone uh, to uh, our Greenwich Penn Women Parat Memorial Library book discussion of Night, Sleep, Death, the Stars by Joyce Carol Oates, a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, I hope you've all read it, but even if you haven't, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll say enough that you'll want to read it when we're done. Um, leading our discussion tonight is Barbara Erentru. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Erentru. Um, Erentru, uh, author and member of the Greenwich Pen Women. So we're going to get started. Barbara, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, as, as you know, this is a very long and very, I think, very um, prominent book for our time. And um, I'm glad that we decided to read this together. And I was very happy to, um, to read it. I know a lot of people looked at it and it says 700 pages. I don't know how I could ever read this book. And then as you get started, I did it on uh, ebook. So it was the amount of time that I had to read it. I said, oh my God, it's days. <laughs> 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 but I got finished in a month and I'm so happy I read it. Um, I'm going to start with the poem that begins the, the book, because I think this is the essence of the entire book. And that, that's why she put it here. And uh, from what I, I heard from um, somebody who was interviewing her, this is one of Walt Whitman's later poems after he wrote Song of Myself. And it kind of gets you into the whole feeling of the book. So here goes. <clears throat> a clear midnight. This is thy hour, O soul, thy free flight into the wordless, away from books, away from art, the day erased, the lesson done, thee fully forth emerging, silent, gazing, pondering the themes thou lovest best. I won't loop in. And Joyce Carol Oates took this poem and wrote a book about it, really, and called it Night, Period, Sleep, Death, the Stars. And each one of those periods means a, a chapter, um, actually, a part of her book. And if you look at it, um, the first point is like night where everything happens and people are being, you know, I know that feeling just plunged into darkness and then sleep where you are kind of in that moment where you're, you're kind of dreaming, you're, you're feeling what's going on, but you're not really sure it's real. And then death I felt was the death of all of their old life all everyone's old life disappeared. And then the stars are the people in the book um, who, who make up the book. And also the fact that she looks to the stars for her answers a lot of the times, Jesslyn. So anyway, uh, my first question to everyone here is there are a lot of themes in this book, a lot of themes. <clears throat> starting with the whole police brutality, uh, discrimination, there's the theme of being a widow, there's the theme of being a child in a very large family, there's the theme of, of being um, somebody who is homosexual and not able to you know, escape the, the, the bonds that he's put on himself and his family has put on him. And then there is the... Um, the other theme of being the, the youngest child and what do you do with that? So there's more themes that I could even add, but those I think are the basic. Um, so uh, what would you say is the most important theme of this novel? And I'll take anybody who wants to answer. And by the way, uh, you have the ability to unmute yourself. So if you'd like to speak, Please go ahead and unmute yourself and, um, and speak. I'll, I'll respond to that, Barbara, just to get the discussion going. Um, for me, uh, 
perhaps the most um, significant theme was um, uh, Jesselyn's story, the, the widow's story and, um, and her, her journey from you know, losing her husband and just coming to terms with that and without giving anything away in case people haven't read it, but you know, how she evolved. And um, I, I, for me, I think that was, there are, as you say, there are plenty of other themes in the book, um, but I think her journey was uh, paramount for me. Does anybody want to add anything to that? Anyone at all? Um, anyone? This is Diane. Hi, Diane. I found, uh, I agree with Judy in terms of when I walk, when I walk away from the book, um, I found the theme the, of, lo of loss and love regained to be the most powerful. And it is the thing I, I, to me that brought hope into a book that was filled with dysfunction on that. So I was extremely grateful that she chose that. I thought Jessalyn was the, was, is the beating heart of that book. And without her in there, their, um, the sibling rivalry comes to the fore. So maybe the first would be the, res the resumption, the ability to grow back into love. And the second is the sibling uh, rivalry and um, the issues that they face. Yeah, as I began reading that book and realized that it was about a widow, um, I don't know if many people know this, but I lost my husband seven years ago. And when Jocelyn lost her husband, I felt that same depth of despair as if you're falling into a black hole. And if not for my children, I would have been in Jesselyn's situation, but thankfully my children helped me to stay on the right path. But she was in a situation that only somebody who has become a widow could really understand. And Joyce Carol Oates was able to do this very, very well and explain how a widow felt and um, she, she, she gave the feelings that you have, that, that you have lost something of yourself. And I did too. I felt that same way that I'd lost a part of myself. And when that happens, everything changes. Your whole life looks different. And um, she sheltered herself away from everyone because she couldn't accept that she that her life had changed. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the changes that happened to her are because of this fact that she could not accept. She could she she took a long time to accept that she had lost it. And then when she did finally let someone in, I was very worried for her. I mean, I really was. I I was thinking, oh my God, he's going to, you know. Um, do something that's going to make to hurt her. And by that point, we had already, this is how good Joyce Carol Oates is as an author. Even though Jesselyn herself was not a figure that you could really feel sorry for because in many ways she was not asking for any help and she was destroying herself in so many ways, but I did feel sorry for her. I felt I felt she was losing her grip on life. And when she met Hugo, it's like her whole life changed. She she opened up and she started to think there was, you know, another place for her, even though it wasn't that far away from her husband's death. She still needed somebody to guide her. And he was kind of her guiding light. So anybody want to discuss this more? or should we move on? Okay, my next question is, why do you suppose the author began this with the Walt Whitman poem? And I discussed a little bit about it, but why do you think? Anybody? Anyone? 
Well, it, I don't want to say it's the stages of, of, of grief, but um, I, I guess, as you said, Barbara, it, it, it really, she structures the book around this poem. I mean, the night, sleep, death, you know, and the stars. And um, I, I listen, like you, I listened to an interview with Joyce Carol Oates, and she said this was uh, her favorite Walt Whitman poem. And it's mm -hmm. nice and short, which is so unusual for him. Um, but- And uh, for her. And for, yes, right. and for her, <laughs> right. For her. right. Um, but I, I think, I think she, she, she set out to tell the story of, of loss and, and the effect not only on the widow, but on the family, and also to bring in some other themes. But for me, the, the poem was really the, bait, the foundation for the book to give it structure um, as she told that story. I agree. I think that that that's why I started the discussion with it because I think it gives structure to her book. And, and as an author, uh, anything can make you want to write a book. And so reading Walt Whitman's poem made her write this book. Otherwise, um, there were other factors in her life, including I think she lost her her other her first husband now I'm living with her second husband and she knows the idea of loss. So I'm going to go to the third question, which is, um, well, my third question was, how is this poem reflected in the story? And I think we've pretty much discussed this all. Um, my fourth question now is, how important are sibling relationships in this story? Do they help or hinder each character? And I think this is a big one in here. So who would like to talk about that? How important are the sibling relationships in this story? Um, I think to me, when I watch these um, siblings and listen to, and I, I feel like they un, unfurl for me like in a reel in a movie. Um, that I can, I can see them, I can see the house, I can see Jessalyn, all the uh, people around her. And uh, I just, you know, I see these, these adults now behaving as always as children whenever they're around their mommy. And they're, they're so from that perspective, and that raises all the rivalry and the upsets and the love and, issues like that. What, what I do find though, is because they are adults and because she goes through a period, I don't have quite the same interpretation as you do about, on this bar. Um, I have, uh, to me, the, the, she goes through a period of navigating a new life and it's um, maybe less passive on that. But the point behind this is that the kids in this who are now adults, in my view, were, um, real bullies of her. They wanted to protect the, their dad's reputation. They wanted to continue to maintain their control over whatever was happening in her life. And she was going to have none of it. So I was, as I said, like, to me, the, 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 the children survived and, and, and fought and figured out things as a way of showing Jessalyn in a brighter light in some of these things. Back to you. Anybody else have any other um, comments about this? I agree with you, Diane, in many respects that she was going through a changing and a navigating, but in the beginning of that loss, she was at sea. She was really, I think when, when Mac the Knife came into her life, I think that's when there was a turning point for her, when she realized that she had someone else to take care of. I, I mean, she was a woman who had lived for so many years taking care of people. And then suddenly she had no one to take care of. Mm -hmm. And then in comes this very scroungy and surly cat <laughs> who takes over her life, by the way, and, and sleeps with her and scratches her and she doesn't care because she has something to take care of. She now has someone to feed. And um, it's very interesting. One of the 
interviews that I saw was um, the, the part about Jesslyn getting the phone call happens while she is pouring out bird feed into her bird feeders, mm. something that she enjoys doing for the birds. And, and then the phone call happens and her whole life changes and, and she stops caring for everything. And so when Mac the Knife comes in, not only did she not kill herself because I think that was a key factor <laughs> that she decided not to jump into the creek because of the cat. Um, uh, and she, she realized she had another life. She had some place where sh she could go to, you know, she could actually help another thing be part of the world. And I think that was what her, you know, her key was to navigating and starting to realize that she could actually be another person and um, not wanting to have anything from her old life. She wanted to throw away all her old clothes because she started to look at her friends in another way. Her friends were no longer her friends. They had just been um, accepting her oh. as, as Whitey's wife. You know, and that that was a big thing that she learned when she went to visit them. And, and actually, when they visited her and she saw the way they treated her. And uh, so she wanted to give away everything from her old life. And the siblings did not want her, especially um, Beverly. Beverly was very protective of both the house and her things. Beverly thought she would get all her mom's things and she wanted to keep them in good shape and didn't want to get rid of them. And she thought, oh, you know, I'll come over and help her get rid of her dad's things. But that wasn't to be. Mm -hmm. Jessalyn didn't want to get rid of Whitey's things. She wasn't ready to get rid of him yet. So uh, very interesting. Um, I also think Tom plays a big role here as the big brother and in trying to find the answer to his father's death. And the other siblings just didn't care. They really, they said, oh, go ahead and do it. We're not going to be interested. And Jessalyn even wasn't interested. When he says, came to her and told him, I have the results. She said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see them. I don't mm -hmm. care. You know, and, and so the other siblings went and tried to go about their business. But for a few of them, a lot of them, everything changed. Irene, Irene's life completely changed. Her father was no longer there to protect her and give her that support she needed. And so she devolved into a lot of psychological problems and maybe even psychiatric problems. And um, Virgil found uh, new courage, even though he did try to kill himself. He found after trying to kill himself that he was stronger than he thought. And so he also was able to accept who he truly was and be the person he truly was without his father's influence. And Tom was actually able to go about his business and take over his father's business, even though he hadn't wanted to, he realized that this was what he was meant to do. But Sophia, I think, is the only one who remained kind of um, out of that situation until maybe the very end. So I'm not going to go into that. If anyone wants to disagree with me, go right ahead. But um, that was my take on it. Anybody else have anything to say? I would really like to hear from someone else about this. Um, has anyone ever been in a family that large and what it is like to be in a family that large when you lose a family member? Uh, I, I am the youngest of six and I can tell you that when my father died, um, it was, you become unmoored and the relationships mm -hmm. between siblings change. And um, alliances change, and you know it. it she, Joyce Carol Oates really 
uh, did an excellent job, I think, in, in portraying the reality of, of what happens when there is a major loss like this. And, uh, you know, for the, yeah. children, for the grown children. Um, is there, uh, Anita, would you like to say something? I noticed that you're unmuted. Yeah, would you like Anita, to say something? definitely. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm the fourth of six children. And my uh, mother came down with uh, uterine and lung cancer when I was eight years old. And she pulled me into the pantry closet and said that she was dying. I said, I'll pray for you. She says, that won't work. I'm not going to live long. And she suffered for three years uh, before she died. And it was just, I was just 11 when she died. And uh, I sort of fell, had to be responsible for my younger brother and sister, which created all sorts of problems. And my father had to sell our beautiful home to pay my mother's medical bills. We lived with my grandmother in her apartments for um, hmm, maybe 10 months. And it was awful there. It was in the business district of the town. And my sister and I shared an attic bedroom that had no air conditioning or heat. And, and my father um, remarried and we moved into my stepmother's beautiful home in another town. And um, I've had all sorts of trauma and all sorts of problems with some of my siblings. They're all, they've all passed away except for my younger sister. And- um, So sorry. Yeah, it's, it was, you know, I figure I'm living on borrowed time. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, and nobody in my family except for my grandmother and aunt ever lived into their nineties. So, you know, I may be the, you know, one of the ones that may, but, you know, none of my father died with a massive heart attack at 62. Hmm. So anyway, there's a lot of trauma. I haven't read the book, so I can't. Oh, it's OK. Me. I think you should. I think you yeah, know I should. be interested okay. to see you know, the sibling rivalry that goes on in that family well, when the I, father is gone. I had it. Believe me. I mean, I had a bully brother. He's the second oldest who. Um, I still have a misaligned jaw from where he hit me because he wanted to watch a TV program that I was watching. And um, he boxed my older sister so that she lost hearing in one ear. Oh my I mean, it, it was just terrible. And I, I wonder where my father was all this time that this was even allowed. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, you may have read some of the things I've written. Um, yes, Barbara. we have. Yeah, I have. As a letters member, I, I have read some of your memoir. But you can see how, how this kind of situation um, can get out of hand. And when the father is, even when the father is in the hospital, you can see the deterioration of the family as they come to the mother's house. To, to support her and she goes to bed and leaves them and they are back to their old crazy ways and mm -hmm. start to fight and carry on and drink and, and all of the old things that are going on with them come out and get kind of solidified in many mm -hmm. ways, mm -hmm. especially with Virgil and, and Tom. I mean, Virgil and Tom, I don't think ever really get to a point where they're, you know, going to be friends. I mean, they're, they're siblings, but they're never going to be friends. Mm -hmm. And, and um, anyway, uh, that was one of the questions that I thought would kind of talk about what has, um, what, I think it keeps the book alive in your mind, what's going to happen with this relationship? How is Beverly going to react, react to her, to, to Irene doing this or Virgil doing this or, or, I mean, there's a scene in the book where Beverly actually ignores her own brother and you don't know he's 
That's what's so fascinating about Joyce Carol Oates. You don't know about these characters before something happens to them. And there she is ignoring her own brother who is trying to deliver this awful news mm. that their father is in the hospital and she ignores him and runs into the bathroom and locks herself in. <laughs> I, was, I was actually talking out loud, oh my God, Beverly, why are you locking yourself in? <laughs> Has it, have any of you ever read uh, some books on emotional intelligence? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I think that would, you know, you wonder why hate and all this distrust and everything at all. You know, I haven't read the books, but I'm going to. But no, you uh, really should. You really should read this one. But I'd like to, I'd love to hear you speak more, Anita, but we're going to run out of time because yeah. you could speak like for hours and I'd love to hear everything you say. <laughs> so I to, I this will actually, thing. this will, this will kind of talk about what you're talking about. Several of the characters change from the beginning of the story. Which character do you feel changed the most and why? And this is for anyone else who hasn't answered. I'd love to hear your take on this. Anyone at all? Maybe Ruth. That's an answer. Ruth, would you I like to? Read, I haven't read the book, but my daughter, my older daughter, has read, I think, all of her books. Mm -hmm. And I want to know more about my daughter. And uh, okay, well, through her, through her book. We're happy to but, see you here. And you can <laughs> learn more about the book. Um, and I would definitely but, suggest that you start reading that book because oh, definitely. you will. I totally understand a lot about your daughter and but Joyce Carol. Oates. I also <laughs> lost my husband um, five years ago, and I so have, sorry. I'm I'm not with with you in Connecticut. I'm in Illinois in Chicago oh. with my daughter. So I'm unraveling, and I'm so delighted to hear your evaluation or or enjoyment of this book. Um, yes, I did. It was me. hard. It was hard. Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. was hard going through it, and I I won't lie, I was crying. Some oh, of I the cry. I some of it, mm -hmm. I was crying, and 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 um, I said, why am I reading this book to <laughs> to bring it back? It's seven years, and I I no, I thought that, mm -hmm. but it it brought back everything, and I started to rethink everything about how I felt at that point, and I I personally wound up in the ER because oh. I was so dehydrated from crying oh. that I, oh. I had to get one and a half bottles of, of, um, of uh, oh. liquid to get oh. me started. And then the following day, because we knew it, they had the um, ceremony. So it was very tough day for me. I, mm -hmm. very I, tough went through, I went through a very tough period with my health immediately after his passing and fortunately I, my family came and have changed my life yes they so do totally. they do yeah, they do so totally. they change your but life now i'm trying to find myself so well i'm, so I'm hoping that you will that you will find i actually have written a book i will talk about it after if you want mm -hmm. to um about i have poems that i wrote during the time oh. that I was mourning my husband oh. and oh. it's called to probably forget me living with and without Hal. So mm -hmm. if you wanna find out more about it, you know, oh. I'll, I'll talk oh. to you about it. But Love right it. now, uh, anybody else who wants to talk about how the characters develop through the book? Well, Anyone? I was, um, I know you want new people to speak. I'll just, uh, maybe I'll get somebody uh, talking. Um, this is Judy from Parat. For me, the two uh, siblings who changed the most were um, Lorene, who um, in many ways was really very, was kind of terrible. She was a, a she was a, she's a hard ass. She was, she, you know, she was, she was tough. She was I've tough. met people like that. I have very met tough. principals like that. And then Virgil, you know, uh, who um, who had to come to terms with his um, his sexuality, and also I think feeling that he 
never had his father's approval, never had his father's love. And then when he finds out, when the will is read, and he finds out that he, he received as much money as all his siblings, he's, in some ways it kind of sets him, it, it gives him a boost, I think, and it helps him realize that he was loved, um, that his father did love him and did consider him his, his child. But for me, those two, Lorene, who's the middle daughter, and Virgil, who's the um, second to youngest, um, had the most transformation. Anybody else? Anybody have any other ideas of who might have changed too? Okay, well, I think also we have to add in Jesselyn. Of course. Oh, of course. Because Jesselyn changed probably the most. I, mm -hmm. I think Virgil changed a great deal, but Jesselyn changed the most. Mm -hmm. Jesselyn changed her appearance. Jesselyn changed her outlook on life. Jesselyn changed her thoughts about people. Um, she changed everything. And so she was, I think, the biggest change. And also, I think, Sophia. Because Sophia had been going through um, this almost somnambulant state of, of being in this lab where she was killing animals to do research and then woke up and realized that she was doing this kind of research when somebody called her out on it. And, um, and I think that when this person called her out on it, who was Virgil, um, I think that maybe she listened to her, you know, her older brother and realized in that way that she, had, she needed to rethink her life. And although she was very, very much involved with the, um, the person who was in charge of the um, lab, oh, what was his name, Arif? Oh, what was his name? Diane, do you remember it? Nope. Okay, right. it started with an A. Yeah, it was an unusual name. Yeah, he, he, uh, he, he, to her, very great surprise did not think this was a big deal that she wanted to change her life and so she really changed and went back into um you know what she really loved to do so i think sophia changes too mm -hmm. i have to i have to be someplace else so i'm going to say goodbye. oh well thank you very oh. much for coming anita yeah. and for sharing yeah, I, I really appreciate it. didn't have time to read the book and I'm sorry I'm late even getting here. <laughs> no, but definitely do read it. Yes. I will. I'll get it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. So anyway, my next question, which is um, something that I think we can discuss, but maybe later. I think it's going to be something to discuss later. How important this is, the th this is the next question after that. How important is the theme of police brutality in this story? And how does it affect the, um, the, um, each character? Well, police I, brutality, and how does it affect each character? I think Whitey, uh, or you know, the husband, uh, and again, I don't know if I want to give away what happens, but um, well, it starts in the prologue, so I really, I really yeah, don't hopefully. think, yeah. Hopefully, yeah. That, yeah, that's yeah, right. Spoiler. It's so, not a spoiler. So he, you know, he on the surface, he does something good. He sees uh, a person of color being um, attacked, you know, physically abused by the police officers, and he stops to intervene. But in some ways it shows his hubris in that he thinks, well, I'm a white guy and I can just walk into this situation and I can just, you know, control, they're gonna listen to me. Um, and indeed they don't listen to him. And he, you know, uh, he ends up becoming a victim as well. So I think um, it's, I think it's really interesting um, the theme of, you know, racism and, and, and the, um, attitudes that are, that we don't even realize that we hold, you know, uh, some of them are among the siblings, how horrified they are that, you know, they whisper he, it, when, when Jeslyn's dating a, 
uh, Hispanic, you know, he's Hispanic, you know, <laughs> like they're totally freaked out by it. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, not, oh, she's met someone who really loves her and cares about her and, you know, is, is wants to take care of her and, and, you know, and, and help her to become the best person she can. No, they're, they're worried about the surface things. So um, I think it's, especially today, it's very timely, you know, with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and, 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 um, you know, I, I, I was, I found that opening scene with what happens. I could see my husband doing something like that, being like Whitey, seeing something like that, stopping and, you know, wanting to protect the victim and becoming a victim himself. I mean, this is the world we're living in. So mm -hmm. I thought it was very powerful. Diane? Yeah, I had a different perspective on it. And my perspective was, uh, first of all, one of the reasons I had picked up the book was because I... Um, was very interested in how Joyce Carol Oates might attack something like the black and white divide in the United States through her book in a very timely fashion. Um, so I went into it really uh, eager to learn more about this and read this. But I found, in fact, that it her, the interaction of Whitey and the cops, in my mind, was simply a prop. And I was a bit disappointed, in fact, that it didn't run as strongly through the story as I had expected it to. It was a way, it was the catalyst. Um, and even in my Goodreads review, I had mentioned the same thing, that it, it was that the police brutality was a kind of a technical tool for getting the story started, but it seemed to disappear and or wane substantially after the openings. So yeah. I, I actually saw in an interview that the reason that she put it in the prologue is because why she put a prologue in as opposed to not putting a prologue in. And that discussion could take a while too because um, I won't go into it, but a lot of people feel that prologue is um, a tool that you don't need to use, that you should tell everything in dialogue through, this, through the story or backstory. It, it always works better than prologue. But in this case, Joyce Carol Oates said, the reason she put the prologue in is because she wanted the reader to know all of the facts so that when you saw what the police actually said, what Tom uncovered, that you would know they were lying and you would see how they were lying and the ways that they lied in so many ways and the ways that they cover up things and get rid of evidence and do all that kind of stuff. So she wanted that to be seen by the reader as, as something that could, could be done. And, and so she wanted that part of the police situation to be seen, but also I found very interesting the um, the interaction with the Indian doctor. I thought his reaction when he found that, oh my God, if I tell the truth here, when the police started shadowing him, he realized that he was going to become a victim again. Mm -hmm. And when he realized this, and he realized that he was Indian and that it, it would affect all of his people, he started to think, nope, I can't do it. You know, I can't do it. So there was discrimination there. And then Sophia, when she mm -hmm. was stopped mm -hmm. on her own street by a policeman, and he did those, I think, awful things to her. Agreed. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was like mortified. And, and, and very, very angry. And she also had that same feeling, well, I'm a white girl. I live on this street. I'm, I'm part of this class of people. Why did he even bother with me, you know? And she thought back to if she had been black and if she had been black, that would have been a whole other story. Mm -hmm. And 
Joyce Carol Oates has you wondering um, in so many ways, this discrimination against Hugo, like you said, Hugo mm -hmm. is a very cultured Hispanic man. And, and they, they make him out to be the gardener. Yeah. She's, mom, is, mom is dating the gardener. That's what she said, Beverly. She said, I can't believe it. Mom is dating the gardener. They think he's the gardener. And, and because one time he brought a tree to, a, a rose bush to, to Jessalyn. And I found Hugo to be one of those people that um, seemed almost not to be real. I thought in some ways he was a figment of Jessalyn's imagination <laughs> because he was so not real. She met him in the cemetery and then all this stuff that happened. But when, I won't give away what happens, but I, I had for a long time thought he was not real, but he did do the photograph of her. So he had to be real. But um, it, it just, I think discrimination goes through the entire book. Tom finds that they won't give him all the information and it just kind of gets swept under the rug with this very um, pat description and money. They want to, they want to give him lots of money. You know, the, mm -hmm. they, they want to pay him off mm -hmm. so that this incident can be swept under the rug and nobody has to talk about it, you know, because in a fashion, the fact that they cause the death of a white man it, you know, is, is a very, they, they didn't know how to deal with that, the police. And, and so they just kept lying, lying, lying and not giving him answers. And then finally just throwing up their hands and saying, okay, whatever, we're giving you money, goodbye. You won the suit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that kind of thing just, you know, that's why you need the prologue. Anyway, let's go on to another question. Um, after reading this story, would you say Whitey McLaren was a good father? McLaren was a good father. I think it was a, I think it was, I mean, we're all flawed and he was certainly flawed. A lot of people um, just I think he was a good provider. Um, I think he was a little bit of an overbearing husband. Um, you know, he did, he wanted to determine how Jeslyn wore her hair and that she colored her hair and that she, you know, and, and, and everything and not tell her things, not give her too much information about the business or about finances it was almost, you know, it, it's insulting. Like he didn't think she was bright enough to be able to handle those things. So, um, I think he he was not without fault, without faults, um, and I would have think I would find him a little overbearing um, if I were to meet him. Um, he wasn't a he didn't try to meet his children where they were. He tried to kind of dictate what he thought they should be, and as long as they went along with that, then everything was fine. So. Okay, uh, anyone else? I know that some people just left. So. Yes, we're down to just a few. Yes, um, anyone want to, Lee, do you want to, Lee Payne, do you want to add anything? Unmute yourself, please. Okay. Unmute yourself. Oh, there, there we go. Yes. Uh, no, I'm sad to say that I have not read the book, but I'm very interested in the conversation. And I think you're doing a great job of, uh, of interesting me in the book. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. Anybody else? Monica, un unmute yourself, please. Hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi. Anyway, I want to thank you so much, and I'll just reiterate what just what was said. I have not read the book, but I do. <laughs> I do. I do. Well, I was interested because I've I haven't read her in a while, but um, I have read her, and I was interested in the title, and the discussion is really. I mean, thank you so much. It's really making me, you know, that that's on my reading list now. Well, thank you. Uh, I. I, I also, when I said night sleeps, 
Death of Stars. And they said, this is the book that you're going to discuss. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I said, that's an interesting title. And mm -hmm. then uh, I, I think Joyce Carol Oates, I've read a couple of her books and she's, she never fails to fascinate me with her, her storytelling. So this is a story that I think you'll really enjoy. And it's written in her very, a very unusual, uh, close third person style where, you know, you feel like you're part of the character. Very, you feel that you know these characters very, very well. So I'm going to go on. So do you have anything more to say? Anybody else? I just think Whitey as a, as a father was not my idea of a father. I mean, my husband was somebody who expected his children to do certain things, but he would never have treated his children in the fashion that Whitey treated. Virgil, for instance, the way he treated him was so low and uh, unforgivable. I just wanted to you know, slap his, slap his hand at that, at what he did to Virgil. I mean, and, and just the way he, um, he, he built up certain children and left certain children to in the dirt, basically. So, and also the way he treated his wife, which was very um, old fashioned, patriarchal, you should wear this one instead of that one, you know, and that kind of thing where my husband would never say that to me. <laughs> so I knew, I knew and, and as a father, he accepted his children as they were, except if something was really strange, he wouldn't let them wear. But, but other than that, um, I had an uncle who was like that. So I know patriarchal fathers, but never had. So I'm going to go on to another question, which is, um, what do you feel the role is of the cat in the story? And I have to tell you that um, during an interview, uh, Joyce Carol Oates brought out her cat and she said that there's somebody in the waiting room. <laughs> I'll let them in. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that she, um, she, uh, she wanted to put a cat in there. She felt it would humanize the story. <laughs> so, so that's what she did. And uh, what do you think of the cat? Anyone? Well, it's only Judy and, and Diane. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's, and Monica's still here. Um, Monica, follow... Monica hasn't read. And who do we have here? Um, yes, can you unmute yourself? Um... 203-869-1960 and tell us who you are. Okay. So let me, um, it, it okay, might be, yeah. Um, I, to Hello. me, oh, wait oh. a minute. Carla, could you wait two seconds? Somebody else is speaking, so you'll have your turn in a second. Diane? So you were talking about the cat. To me, um, the cat was the um, almost the manifestation of the start of, of uh, Jessalyn's uh, liberation and freedom. Her, the beginning, no matter, everybody, her kids hated that cat. And Tom's response to the cat was one of the most brutal responses I've ever seen mm. and really upsetting. And um, to me, the cat was her, her definite and very clear uh, decision that her decisions about her life and her, how she lives in her home are now hers. They're not for anybody else's um, input and in fact, she's very good in my mind of, of just kind of like drifting off as her children tell her everything that she's doing wrong. Oh, so really? Um, but in any case, the cat to me was that manifestation of her will and the construction of the, the start of the construction of this new Jessalyn. And uh, that's why the response of the children and particularly Tom is in was was it, the cat was everything but a cat 
to mm-hmm. to Tom um, with something, some symbolically representation of father and will and, and control and all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but so to me, the cap was a very important way for us to start to see Jessalyn as uh, an independent being without making decisions about her own life in her own house. Hello, caller. Please identify yourself. Um, this is Ruth. Huh? I'm trying. I got back in to the meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, Ruth. Yes. Oh, okay. But Ruth. now, how do I mute? I don't know how to mute myself. Don't worry. Um, don't just put mute on. It's okay. If you go down with your with your cursor. And, uh, oh, I'm on go. my phone. Okay, so just put mute on. You should, you should see mute. We can and mute it, the account. We'll mute it. Yeah, we yeah, can. And also, it. you can put your video on. You just look at the video camera okay. and put your video on. She's so anyway, I, I agree with Diane 100%. I felt that the cat was everything that Jessalyn was changing and that she wanted to have her own life back and be herself and also that um the tom situation how tom reacted to the cat was Mm. unforgivable i was just like yelling at him what are you doing tom why are you doing that (laughs) i I would like to make a comment about uh the cat um jeslin takes it takes this cat in and he's a real tom and he hasn't been altered and he probably has, he does have diseases and things wrong with him. And she allows the cat to sleep in her bed, sleep on her bed. And I think it's very interesting. I found it very interesting in telling that it was Hugo who take, you know, says now he obviously needs to go to the vet, you know, <laughs> he needs to be seen by a vet and he very gently, but he, he manages it, which a sensible person would. This wasn't something Jeslin was was doing, you know, at that point. But he, in a very gentle way, uh, he doesn't say, get rid of the cat, you know, but he says, okay, you want to keep the cat? The cat needs to go to the vet and, and takes care of the cat. And I found that very, I, I really liked that. I found that, um, I really liked Hugo for doing that. Well, um, you know, I also thought that Hugo in that sense took, the place of her husband who would have at that point told her to do it also. And um, I think she needed somebody. She wasn't quite ready to be on her own, although she thought she could be on her own. She wasn't quite thinking straight. And I know for a fact that this happens after you lose your husband, that you lose track of things, that you forget things, that you, you don't think in terms of of normal ways of living. You really don't. And if you don't have anyone to keep you on the straight and narrow, you might forget things, you know? And and, um, this is how women um, tend to be moved into situations they shouldn't really be in because at that particular point in your life, you aren't really thinking straight. And I did do some questionable things in the couple of years after my husband passed away, I wasn't quite myself. So I really could identify with Jesslyn and how she couldn't keep things straight. So let's move on. And I have, um, during the course of the story, there are many instances of social gatherings. How do you suppose the author felt about these? And, you know, there's only Judy or Diane, so. <laughs> Um, do you mean, when you say social gatherings, do you mean that Jeslyn attended or when she had the, when she had all the of children? Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of these social gatherings that she attended and how did, how did the author feel about them? Was, was the author speaking through Jeslyn or was she talking about, you know, something else? Did anybody have any thoughts? I just, for me, I felt that she was talking about how um, very over, overproduced some of these events are and that you have to be just so with people 
you have to be on your very best behavior, that you don't really talk about things that are important to you because that would cause maybe a stir in the air. <laughs> so you don't really talk about stuff that would be important to you. And I think also she showed by these events that, um, that the women who she had, like I said in the first part of my discussion, the women who she had thought were her friends were really just there. They didn't really know her as she truly was, this new person. And I think it's interesting that at one event she shows up with Hugo in this beautiful flowered outfit <laughs> and they look at her and they say, who is this? Mm -hmm. You know, her children too. Look at her, look at her. Look what this man has done to her, you know? And what, what is she like now? And will she be the same? And so I think in that respect, that's what they did. But um, Diane? I thought the, uh, that the idea of Hugo and she going to these parties was quite interesting. All of these social activities you're talking about, whether it's even having multiple kids around, you know, she's had, Jessalyn has spent all her life with Whitey um, being in the periphery. And I have no doubt about that because Whitey was larger than life. And mm -hmm. I mean, he was described that way. Um, so Jessalyn, every time she goes into a new situation with new people or even the same people, has to negotiate and navigate a whole new set of relationships that where at one point she didn't have to worry about it at all because she either got, she was referred to as Whitey's wife or she was um, introduced. And so now she has to go in like a, in a social situation, which many of us are experiencing in our reentry times. Um, to go into a social situation uh, with only herself. And that to me was, is, is bold and courageous. And when she, when she goes with um, Hugo to that party, it was like the debut of a sexual being. Um, she had come back into life again and uh, she was stunning and beautiful and all these things that people hadn't ever quite thought of because they always saw Whitey first. Exactly. I felt the same way that she, she actually got into the spotlight as herself and mm -hmm. she was quite a unique person and she had never thought of herself as that a caregiver. So mm -hmm. that's what I thought too. And um, the other thing now, let's, let's look at this. Wait a minute. Okay, so the, the other question I have is how important is, this is something that, um, how important is location in this story? Do you think Jesslyn was affected by being in the Galapagos Islands and how? I think she okay. was affected by being in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, she, it was totally outside of her uh, of her world. It was something totally foreign. And um, again, without saying everything that happens there, um, and, you know, and I I think it was like her final. Um, her, her push through her in, in her evolution from widow and all, as she's as she's evolving as she's coming emerging and then she's on the Galapagos Islands and she's in a totally different environment and doing something um, that perhaps she never thought she could or would uh, be able to do um, I thought it was it was very um, significant. And I think she had a significant reaction to it. Diane? Well, you're, you're, I found it uh, a, a little bit different than that. One is that, yes, the, the island itself creates this kind of independent bubble that she can, uh, that she and Hugo can be in with all of their own curiosities and interests. But, um, to me, the purpose of that whole Galapagos is to bring that 
that soaring incline that we have when our first relationships are so terrific and that illness there brings her back to earth and down to earth on these things and um at some point she's going to need to deal with her family again and she's going to need to figure out how to take care of uh hugo and things of this nature so to me it was a useful trip not only for the highs but also to really start to uh represent and, and inject the lows of our lives into uh, their life together yeah, I think in the Galapagos, I, just thinking back on it, I was starting to think that it was very Shakespearean, <laughs> that things happen outside the Galapagos, and you could think of the Galapagos as the forest in, in the Shakespearean um, plays. And um, outside of the Galapagos, things were different. You know, life went on differently, but in the Galapagos, um, they, they had a different life. Mm -hmm. Things were more um, quiet and more, um, they were more attuned to the, to, the, to, this, to the nature. And everyone was a little different in the Galapagos, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a little bit, personalities changed. And, and um, I think she saw another part of Hugo that mm -hmm. he was so intent on getting his photographs no matter what right <laughs> you know, he was really bent on getting his photographs even if it meant that he he might you know get hurt or something of that sort and she hadn't really realized how important it was to him to be a photographer and that it was his life mm -hmm. and I think she realized it then and she realized how much of a part of him it was. And also I think the ship is kind of like the trip back to the, the world and things happen on the ship that, you know, that, that, that um, they get them back into the world. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I, I think she did something in the Galactic, in actually starting in Ecuador where her um, her situation was very um, discomforting mm. in Quinta, in Quinta, Quinta. I think you'd say that Quinta, the the, the main city, and and uh, I think you also see how wonderful a person Hugo is mm. in that in that hotel room set setting where he takes care of her. He's just so care taking such good care of her. And I was so worried. I I still had this in the back of my head. I had fear that something was going to happen mm. to her. I always worried until I saw the, the the most wonderful care that he took of her, and how much he cared for her. And you know, I won't spoil it for anybody about what happened with them. But that that those scenes were just so beautiful. Mm. made me want to go down there actually <laughs> and be there only I, I i didn't want to have anything that happened to her happen to me so right <laughs> but, but but i i do think that um i found out a lot about yugo in that respect and i think that she did very much make it shakespearean i, I don't know if anybody else agrees with me but um i think that's something that she's She's, she's um, wonderful. And I saw that her influences were, um, were of course, Walt Whitman, but also uh, Lewis Carroll. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you, you out of the, in the world and then she, they fell through the rabbit hole and had all these miraculous adventures. And I think that that's very much like what happened in the book, mm -hmm. that, that she was kind of in an, her own Alice in Wonderland there. So anyway, um, the last part is the very last question. Who are the stars in this novel? And can you explain? Hi ladies, I'm gonna thank you and say I'm going Oh, thank to you oh, so much, you. Monica. I hope that you go and read the book. I'm looking forward to it. So thanks to you all. So, oh, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. 
So who do you think are the stars in this novel? I think uh, all the characters are the stars, certainly the, the, the grown children and also Jeslyn and, and, and Hugo as well. I think they're all the stars. Um, and Diane? Uh, to me, to me it's, uh, it's Jeslyn. And it's like she is the sun and everybody else is orbiting around her. And that is by design of, uh, of Joyce Carol Oates. Um, and so to me, the, even though all of, the stu all of the children were affected by the death of their father, I wouldn't have really cared that much about many of them if the book had, had addressed each of them and not given me the beating heart of Jessalyn and what she goes through. So to me, that's a start. Okay, I agree. Um, there's, there's so many parts of this story. And uh, I, I have to say that after listening to her discuss the whole, she didn't really discuss so much as tell why she wrote it. I don't think she discussed it a lot. I, I think it's a fait accompli to her. And as, as she said, she doesn't really remember what she wrote in her last novel. So <laughs> if you can imagine <laughs> that she, she needs the book to actually see what she wrote in the, in the novel. And um, as an author, sometimes you do forget your story, but you can, you know, it can be refreshed. But I think in this case, this story is very significant. I would just say to anyone who hasn't read it, it's very significant to this time period that it will help you to understand more about race relations. It will help you to understand more about relations between children and a family. It will help you to understand more about being a widow if you are and the consequences of it and makes it okay to not always be thinking of your husband, you know, it's like at some point she stops thinking of Whitey and it, it makes, makes it okay to not do that. And so I just want to wrap it up. Any, any questions that you have, Diane or Judy? That still uh, just, I was going to let you know that uh, I follow her on um, Twitter and she's in there with her cats all the time. She's <laughs> extremely private. And she just introduced another book. She just wrote another book. And in the time of, since the beginning of the pandemic, she's now completed and published three. Oh my so, God. Yeah, she's extremely uh, prolific and she seems to have, and they're all unusual. This is not a formula writer. Um, so each one of them is markedly different. And some of them address some similar themes, but her... Um, her writing capacity and her in her just her not only her imagination but also her the volume at which she works is um, I haven't seen anybody else like that out there. Can can you tell us the name of the next book? Because I didn't read that. Breathe, breathe, breathe. We have it. Yeah. We have yeah. it at the library. Right. Okay. Breathe. I haven't been in the library, Judy. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, and and I've heard that it, you know it's if you think that this book had some issues associated with uh, uh, widowhood and sadness, then that one is even more extreme. But in every place that everybody that um, whose review I read said they were extremely glad they read it, um, but it was it wrenching. So I've got to not go as there. long, right? Not as long. Mm, no, yeah, it is, but it isn't as long. No. Okay. I, at 700 pages like you, I was shocked on that one. But I'm also seeing a lot of other books that are that length, some that actually justify it. And so. you know what? I was looking through it and as an editor, I was thinking, what could she have cut? And she had nothing to cut. It was so well written. There was absolutely nothing that I would have cut in that book. No sentence yeah. that I wouldn't have put in that book. Every yeah. sentence was necessary there. 
which is kind of amazing for 700 pages. So uh, I just want to wrap it up saying thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this wonderful book. And for anybody who hasn't read it, I would definitely suggest it. It's, like I said, a long book. It's going to make you think a lot after I close the book. Um, and I, I was reading it on my iPad, so I, I just um, closed it. And I think um, the only thing that I, I do wish she had, like a Diane, I do wish she had gone into more detail on the um, terrible situation on race relations in this country. And um, other than that, I have nothing else to say, but read this book and Judy, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Great job, and, great job. And thanks to the Greenwich Pen Women for all. Oh, you're welcome. Just presenting. call on us anytime. <laughs> and thank you to the Parat. We love this collaboration. It's wonderful. Thank you.